Since we are kind of fascinated with the afterlife, I say we meaning like popular culture, it's been a few years now, I mean centuries, where we've told stories about things like vampires, um, even zombies, which are kind of a modern construct if you think about it. It's more um, a term from Haiti, uh, which is kind of like derived from the continent of Africa, where they say zombie, which is actually a term meaning um, like a supernatural resurrection of something, an animate corpse. This is not a thing of science. It's it's entirely like a religious or philosophical uh, supernatural construct. And, and really, it's n not what we experience or really like to, um, to indulge in in popular culture now. Our zombies, they're almost always caused or brought about by some kind of medical means. If you think about, you know, there's like bacteria or viruses, something that infects like the brain stem of the dead and causes them to walk around and, you know, do things, usually horrible things, and they kind of rot in place until they finally can no longer sustain any kind of movement because everything's kind of deteriorated, which is a little bit of a hideous notion, but. Alas, we are fascinated by the hideous, are we not? And beyond that, being fascinated with the hideous, we are also fascinated with life after life. Kind of, we call in this case, the undead. They're not really dead, because we think of something dead like staying in the ground and not coming up and trying to eat our brains. But we've been fascinated by vampires and zombies. Uh, even Frankenstein's monster was a dead thing and came reanimated back to life. What is it about the afterlife that so fascinates us? I mean, sometimes I wind up being just freaking terrified about the notion. Uh, regardless of where you come from philosophically, what you believe about the afterlife, there are moments in the wee hours of the night where doubts creep in and scare you to death. Figuratively speaking, of course. But kind of in our current little narrative here, Sleeping Beauty has kind of fallen victim to some kind of medical curse, maybe having to do with like a botched blessing from one of these fairy god parents. Perhaps they weren't as wonderfully gifted as they thought, and they kind of screwed it up. But it dawns on me now that I just said she suffered from something medical and then talked about a blessing from fairy god parents. Okay, so it's not a perfect narrative. And as a result, now she is the walking dead. And as such, kind of horrific even to Maleficent, and she's going to try and whack her brain out. Briefly commenting on what's going on right now in the drawing, I was deeply dissatisfied with what I had done up until this point with this drawing. I mean, just structurally, it was whacked out. I realize I'm drawing an animate corpse, but at some point you really have to pay attention to the anatomy. And so I kind of went overboard here. I started reconstructing what it's actually like to look inside the body. Because really, you're just laying flesh and muscle and clothing on top of real structure. It's like actually planning something out with a better blueprint. My blueprint was kind of hasty and junky, and so I've kind of gone in at this stage and started redrafting that because it's going to give me a lot more realism. I recognize I'm drawing an animate corpse. Once again, realism, totally relative. But since I had decided to go back and kind of redraw all these elements and do a better job for crying out loud, and kind of make good on that due diligence that that I should have done the first time around. I was being lazy. I just kind of drafted these hands poorly. And what I really wanted, I used it as an excuse. What I really wanted was distorted kind of um, uh, hand gestures, like unnaturally bent and curling fingers. And as a result, I looked at those hands. I'm like, hey, they look bad because I'm making them unnaturally bent. When really I was just being lazy because there is an underlying structure. Even if you're gonna kind of mess with it, this hand clearly was struggling with it. I wanted it to be, <laughs> I really wanted to hide the hand at that point, but I am no Rob Liefeld. So I struggled and I worked through it. Every one of these little fingers has a shape and has a contour and, and I really wanted it to look proper. 
this one was just killing me. I mean, seriously, I was looking at reference at this point. I was erasing and cutting and pasting and resizing because I had invested so much time at this point in this, I really needed to just see it through. Uh, it was a matter of principle at this point. Get some decent structure, move on with this drawing. I kind of left the under drawing at that point because I wanted to see how far I'd come and there was just still some anatomical issues. That arm was too long and so I started moving things around. It's the power of digital. And I started feeling a little bit better. If a face can have a rictus snarl, then hands can have a gnarly rictus feel. I recognize also, once again, rictus not used properly in this context, but I felt a lot better about the way these hands were gnarled and twisted. A lot like her overall posture, kind of like ligaments and muscles are failing. So there's a herky-jerky quality to her movement and her posture. And these poor little fairy god parents are just upset. Oh my gosh, you can see him kind of crying out on her shoulder or sitting forlornly on her back. I just thought it was a nice touch. I couldn't ignore them, so I just kind of swept them up in this narrative just a little bit. Of course, I didn't make them zombies, because that'd be weird. Here we are, I'm trying to figure out what in the world was wrong with <laughs> kind of where that arm was placed. I drew some underlying anatomy, not a whole ton, because it wasn't necessary. I made it red so that I could see it like really apparently. And I think it turned out better. This is a lot more believable. And so it's no surprise that I like some weird old literature, right? I like uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Talked about that in a previous video. One of my faves, great vocabulary, great writing, a little verbose at times, not everyone's perfect. But uh, one of my other favorites is kind of this cosmic horror author named H.P. Lovecraft. And if you're uh, passingly aware with the Call of Cthulhu story, he's become a cult favorite author. Most people haven't actually read what he wrote, but they like the idea of his stories. And it, it, it's really, we were to be honest, if you've read his stuff, he's kind of famously bigoted and somewhat, not somewhat, he's actually pretty racist. And that really sucks. That really brings it down because his writing is amazing. So I try and kind of move past that. You know, it's like, I don't even want to engage in that part of it because I really like kind of this cosmic horror. He doesn't go for all the body horror and stuff of chopping things up grotesquely. He kind of tells a story and leaves a ton to your imagination because it's our imaginations that truly, truly frighten us. And he kind of employs that as a tool. There's a story called Herbert West Reanimator that's kind of a part of a compilation of stories in a, uh, a book called, I believe it's called Weird Tales. Let's see if I can find it. Oh yeah, here we go. I have that, that cover of the book. That is some truly hideous art. And um, he just kind of part of it along with some other stuff that I haven't read from this volume because I really couldn't care less at this point. Just want to read Lovecraft. And so at this point, there is a story about a, a doctor named Herbert West. He's an actual doctor, but he is fascinated with life after death. And he thinks that by making a solution of chemicals, he could pump it into the veins of a corpse and have it come back to, quote, life. Life as we know it, not sure, because we're not that smart yet. The story is actually being told from the assistant's point of view, because quickly, in the first paragraph, he mentions Herbert West is dead, is gone, and it's kind of scary to him. I'd like to read the initial chapter from this, um, actually just the last parts of it, called From the Dark. To set the scene, Herbert and his apprentice decide that they really want to pursue a human corpse. But there are some issues. You can't just go digging up a grave somewhere, and ain't nobody going to give you Grandpa's corpse to work on. So they have to go find something that is fresh, because you're worried about that, right? It's like produce. You want to make sure you got a good, fresh corpse. With this corpse, they need it to be strong and pale, and they need it to be freshly buried, so they go to the potter's field. The potter's field is a place where poor people would be buried. They would be buried shallow and in simple pine boxes, and they would not be embalmed. This made them excellent candidates for this supernatural story. So at this point, 
There had been some botched attempts at exhuming bodies by people that Herbert and his scientist buddy have employed. So they said, you know what? You want something done right? Let's take our erudite selves out into the potter's field and dig up a fresh one. They dug this guy up, and this is where we're actually going to pick up the tale. Let me read a little bit from Herbert West, Reanimator, by H.P. Lovecraft. It was a repulsive task that we undertook in the black, small hours, even though we lacked, at that time, the special horror of graveyards which later experiences brought to us. We carried shades and oil-dark lanterns, for although electric torches were then manufactured, they were not as satisfactory as the tungsten contrivances of today. The process of unearthing was slow and sordid. It might have been gruesomely poetical if we had been artists instead of scientists and we were glad when our spades struck wood. When the pine box was fully uncovered, West scrambled down and removed the lid, dragging out and propping up the contents. I reached down and hauled the contents out of the grave, and then both toiled hard to restore the spot to its former appearance. The affair made us rather nervous, especially the stiff form and vacant face of our first trophy, but we managed to remove all traces of our visit. When we had patted down the last shovelful of earth, we put the specimen in a canvas sack and set out for the old Chapman place beyond Meadow Hill. On an improvised dissecting table in the old farmhouse, by the light of a powerful acetylene lamp, the specimen was not very spectral looking. It had been a sturdy and apparently unimaginative youth of wholesome plebeian type, large framed, gray eyed and brown haired, a sound animal without psychological subtleties and probably having vital processes of the simplest and healthiest sort. Now, with the eyes closed, it looked more asleep than dead, though the expert test of my friend soon left no doubt on that score. We had at last what West had always longed for, a real dead man of the ideal kind, ready for the solution as prepared according to the most careful calculations and theories for human use. The tension on our part became very great. We knew that there was scarcely a chance for anything like complete success, and could not avoid hideous fears at possible grotesque results of partial animation. Especially were we apprehensive concerning the mind and impulses of the creature, since in the space following death some of the more delicate cerebral cells might well have suffered deterioration. I myself still held some curious notions about the traditional soul of man and felt an awe at the secrets that might be told by one returning from the dead. I wondered what sights this placid youth might have seen in inaccessible spheres, what he could relate if fully restored to life. But my wonder was not overwhelming, since for the most part I shared the materialism of my friend. He was calmer than I as he forced a large quantity of his fluid into a vein of the body's arm, immediately binding the incision securely. The waiting was gruesome, but West never faltered. Every now and then he applied his stethoscope to the specimen and bore the negative results philosophically. After about three quarters of an hour without the least sign of life, he disappointedly pronounced the solution inadequate. But determined to make the most of his opportunity, and try one change in the formula before disposing of his ghastly prize. We had that afternoon dug a grave in the cellar and would have to fill it by dawn, for although we had fixed a lock on the house, we wished to shun even the remotest risk of a ghoulish discovery. Besides, the body would not be even approximately fresh the next night. So, taking the solitary acetylene lamp into the adjacent laboratory, we left our silent guest on the slab in the dark, and bent every energy to the mixing of a new solution, the weighing and measuring supervised by West with an almost fanatical care. The awful event was very sudden and wholly unexpected. I was pouring something from one test tube to another, and West was busy over the alcohol blast lamp, which had to answer for a Bunsen burner in this gasless edifice. 
when from the pitch black room we had left there burst the most appalling and demonic succession of cries that either of us had ever heard. Not more unutterable could have been the chaos of hellish sound if the pit itself had opened to release the agony of the damned, for in one inconceivable cacophony was centered all the supernatural terror and unnatural despair of an animate nature. Human it could not have been. It is not in man to make such sounds, and without a thought, our late employment, or its possible discovery, both West and I leaped to the nearest window and like stricken animals, overturning tubes, lamps, and retorts, and vaulting madly into the starred abyss of the rural night. I think we screamed ourselves as we stumbled frantically toward the town, though as we reached the outskirts we put on a semblance of restraint, just enough to seem like belated revelers staggering home from a debauch. We did not separate, but managed to get to West's room, where we whispered with the gas up until dawn. By then we had calmed ourselves a little with rational theories and plans for investigation so that we could sleep through the day, classes being disregarded. But that evening, two items in the paper, wholly unrelated, made it again impossible for us to sleep. The old deserted Chapman house had inexplicably burned to an amorphous heap of ashes, that we could understand because of the upset lamp. Also, an attempt had been made to disturb a new grave in the potter's field, as if by futile and spadeless clawing of the earth. That we could not understand, for we had patted down the mold very carefully. And for seventeen years after that, West would look frequently over his shoulder and complain of fancied footsteps behind him. Now, he has disappeared. <laughs> Note how Lovecraft actually doesn't try and tell you why they're horrified. Oh my gosh, we tamped down the earth perfectly well and that thing was exhumed, but it wasn't exhumed by us. Looks like somebody tried to get back into their own grave or something like that. He didn't have to explain it. It's like a good joke. If you have to explain it, well, it wasn't a good joke to begin with. He leaves it up to your imagination. Whoa, why were they so perturbed? Love it. Loved this the way he talks about the, the wails, the screams of this thing that has obviously come to life in the other room. I believe it was my eldest son talked to me about this and he said, Cosmic horror is not something that makes you afraid to go to sleep at night, but it makes you loathe getting up in the morning. It's a truly different approach and I think it takes a lot more skill to weave a story like that. H.P. Lovecraft, prime example. So here I'm going to go ahead and put these two together. I've got uh, Maleficent creeping up behind poor, poor Aurora, the sleeping beauty, who is about to get just whacked by this thing. And I think that at this point, the little fairy godparents don't really know. <laughs> I mean, they might be glad for a little bit of respite from this kind of undeath that Aurora is suffering, but I think they also be a little traumatized. When the deed is actually done, they'll probably really be traumatized. And I'm going to go ahead in, in the future episodes, I'm going to try and tackle other immortal or undead ideas. I'm going to try and lump them into the same video, though. The next one I'm going to make is going to be Mulan and Shan Yu. I believe his name is Shan Yu. He is the antagonist of the Mulan movie. And though Mulan is kind of a train wreck as far as like actual historical significance and history of what happened there, I can't escape the fact that people know it and we kind of want to experience what it would be like if Shan Yu was the vampire hunter and Mulan was a vampire. In that vein, if you've got any ideas about these Disney princesses and how you'd like to see maybe you know, somebody's a werewolf. Who would make a good werewolf and who would make a good werewolf hunter? And make it interesting. Give me some ideas and we'll see what we can pull off together. This has been loads of fun and it is that time in the video where I ask you guys to like the video. Please go ahead and hit the thumbs up if you like this video. And if you like this video and haven't yet subscribed, go hit the subscribe button. And if you have both liked and subscribed but haven't hit the bell, hit the bell. YouTube will go ahead and alert you to the fact that I put out a new video. Don't forget to share this thing with somebody who might find it interesting or maybe give me some new ideas. And lastly, create. Create something, especially if it's a better day for someone else.